very good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Happy New Year, and welcome to the launch of the Singapore Index of Inflation Expectations. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Ting Jin, I'll be your MC for the morning. Now just a couple of gentle reminders before we kick off the program. The first, if you could please switch all mobile devices to the silent mode. And the second is, if you could please reserve all questions to the Q&A session after the presentation. So don't worry, we'll get to them. All right, now this morning, MasterCard and the Sing Hee Boon Institute for Financial Economics and the Singapore Management University are proud to announce the launch of the Singapore Index of Inflation Expectations. This index offers a fresh perspective on the role that inflation expectations play in the Singapore economy. Amid global financial uncertainty, this research plays a significant role in understanding and forecasting the behavioral attitudes that will, in turn, influence the monetary policies of central banks. Now, this morning, Mr. Vicky Bindra, <coughs> President, Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa, MasterCard Worldwide, and Professor Arnut de Meyer, President of SMU, will both make their introductions, followed by the special address by our guest of honor, Mr. Edward Robinson. Assistant Managing Director, Economic Policy of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And this will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Yuwa Hedrick Wong, Global Economic Advisor, MasterCard Worldwide. Professor Jun Yu and Dr. Arobindu Ghosh of the Sim Kee Boon <coughs> Institute for Financial Economics will then present several of the much awaited findings from the inaugural report. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to kick off this morning's program, I'd like to invite Professor Anuj Demeyer, President of SMU, up on stage. Mr. Edward Robinson, Assistant Managing Director for Economic Policy of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Mrs. Anne Cairns, special welcome to you uh, uh, as President of International Markets for MasterCard Worldwide, because I'm going to say that you flew in specially for this from London. I know this is not completely right, but anyway. <laughs> Mr. Vicky Bendra, uh, President of Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa, MasterCard Worldwide. Dr. Yua Edric Wong, uh, Global Economic Advisor for MasterCard Worldwide. And Mr. Lin Chion, Chairman of our Advisory Board for the Sim Ki Boon Institute, as we say, SKBI in short, uh, for Financial Economics. And distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me also welcome you here this morning. I wish you a happy new year, although I have a feeling that for the next weeks I will do nothing else but that. Uh, the new year seems to follow each other all the time. Uh, but it's a true delight to see you here today and to welcome you to the launch of the SKBI MasterCard New Singapore Index of Inflation Expectations. Uh, I would like to first congratulate my colleagues of the Simply Boone Institute uh, in successfully developing uh, this new benchmark index to measure infl inflation expectations. Uh, uh, I'm not an economist, uh, but I am, as everyone, aware that for the past uh, one year, inflation has been a concern for many of us, especially here in Singapore. Uh, consumer price index, which is commonly used as a measure of consumer price inflation, has been hovering, I guess, around about 5% for a few months last year. Uh, and. Uh, when we compare, of course, with the corresponding ones for the year 2010. Uh, in January to November 2011, the CPI was 5.2% higher than uh, compared to the same period last year. And the latest November figure by the Singapore Department of Statistics also showed that, uh, compared to a year ago, the consumer price index rose by 5.7%, which can be, as we all know, attributed to higher cost of accommodation private road transport, food, and a few other things. So it's something that is on our mind. And uh, having more information about it is, I think, important to all of us. And uh, I actually also look forward to our guest of honor, Mr. Edward Robertson from the MES, uh, to share more about that in his, uh, with us in his address. Uh, why are we so worried about it? Because it affects actually all of us in many different aspects of our life. Um, and then, therefore, I believe that Another approach of estimating inflation expectations to assess where consumers think that prices might be heading will offer really an important additional source of invaluable insights and help policymakers and also consumers, uh, but help policymakers to formulate monetary policies aimed towards keeping inflation in check. And to do so, so my colleagues in SKBI 
Professor Jun Yu and Dr. Arobin Bosch have through their surveys with about 400 consumers across Singapore collected information about variables such as length of stay, age, income and gender, just to name a few, and most importantly, their expectations on inflation. They have also conducted the service twice, once in September and another one in December of last year, to gather feedback on these consumers' mid-term and long-term view regarding price movements. And I'm pleased to also note that SKBI will really be releasing their survey findings every quarter after today's official launch. Now, since the establishment of SKBI in July 2008, the Research Institute has been developing and applying research on financial economics with special relevance to Singapore and Asia. It has done so, and I want to remind that for uh, you of that, for those among you who don't know all the activities of SKBI, but it has done that through four centers. The Center for Financial Econometrics, the Center for Silver Security, the Center for S Securitization and Management in Asia, and the Center for Corporate and Investor Responsibility. SKBI has, is in the process of becoming a leading institute for academic research with strong industry application and a practical dimension in the area of financial economics. Its work is conducted in close collaboration with leading scholars in financial economics and financial econometrics from around the world, as well as, as leading international organizations and experts from industry. And so I'm quite proud of the progress that SKBI has been able to make over the last uh, years in becoming a real important force in the landscape of uh, research and applications in financial economics. Now finally, uh, I would like to thank MasterCard for the collaboration and the creation of the Singapore Index of Inflation Expectations. It's actually another great example of how SMU and SKBI, uh, as a research center of SMU, can work together with industry and apply together the research to help industry, policy makers and the public. And the public. Once again, thank you to MasterCard and congratulations to my colleagues of SKBI and our partners of MasterCard on the launch of this very important index. And I wish everybody here a very fruitful and insightful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vendra, President, Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa, MasterCard Worldwide will now say a few words. In this capacity, Mr. Bindra oversees all of the company's activities in the region, including sales, products, business development, business strategy, and relationships with card issuers, merchants, and merchant acquirers. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Vicky Bindra. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, President Arnold. Uh, thank you for the great introduction and, and, and saying all the good things, but first, Again, like he said, let me start with a happy new year. Uh, and just like all of you will be saying it for the next three weeks, let's, let's, let's start with a great new year. Um, and I do want to acknowledge and thank the presence of Mr. Edward Robinson, our guest of honor, um, to lot of the seniors from the university, the provost, the chairman, the president. Um, it's, it's really feeling special to be here. It's our first launch of the year, and it feels very special to be here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we are kickstarting this obviously with an index that is, as uh, the president mentioned, very near and dear to consumers, to economists, to regulators, and to all of us in our daily lives in business, uh, which, is, uh, which is an index of, it's actually pretty much of a multiple inflation expectations. Um, I always get Singapore index of inflation expectations. I think like SKBI, we need to make it, get a short form for this too. Um, which is, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, that doesn't quite, quite cut it. But really, this has been, inflation has been top of mind over many countries and regulators over the past year, particularly, even though it's, it's been, uh, it's, it's important at any point in time. And here is the trick why. If you look at a global recession time, you really can't increase interest rates because interest rates can negatively affect production and income. On the other side, if you look at management of the economy, if your saving rates are only 1% or so in a bank account, and you've got an inflation rate that goes much beyond that, you're really destroying wealth on an ongoing basis for the citizens of your country. So having the right balance and the right hold, which is 
And many times, governments resort to either interest rates or changing their currency rates become very critical tools to understand how someone in Angmokyo can live a good life, whereas the country Singapore does not suffer in terms of either exports, production, or tourism. So it's, it actually becomes far more complex in a lower interest rate environment than in a higher interest rate environment, though there are negative consequences in both. Which is why the relevance of understanding inflation appropriately and dealing with, with it in a meaningful manner so that you, you, you sort of have a proper, uh, proper sort of justification on, on why certain things go, go such. Now, uh, Professor Manu, uh, or Manu Bhaskar is looking at me and thinking because he's given a very simplistic explanation. So I, I apologize for that. I've not been trained very well either in, in economics or, or in research here. But I'm just giving the layman understanding of, of why inflation is, is important. And with the volatility in, in the world today, we believe this is not important just in, in Singapore, which I'm glad we've started here, but we'd love to take the help of, of SNU and others really to do it in, in several of the other countries around it so that you get a regional view of, of, of inflation and how that, because there's again an inter, interplay between the countries and how, how that affects us. From our side, a lot of the work is being spearheaded by Dr. Yuva, and, and he will come on the panel soon and they will discuss the findings, and really being spearheading a lot of issues like this in what we call a, a knowledge management. Uh, knowledge management for MasterCard has been a key priority over the last few years, and with Anne's support, we're actually going to continue to, to invest in that a lot more, to do two or three things. One is really understand what are the critical drivers for consumers at a national or a regional level, that is one. Secondly is, how does it affect employment and how does it, it, it affect different areas of people's life and living over time, so that's the second area. Third is, can you make a meaningful difference in either understanding consumers or understanding patterns for either governments such as tourism boards or for products that can be established well in particular markets. And all of these are, are being spearheaded in, in under the, the leadership of, of Dr. Yuva in trying to understand how do we bring this together in different markets so that we have more clarity and understanding around this. So hopefully there will be a lot more to come, but I do want to acknowledge our partnership with SMU. We feel it goes a lot deeper than just working with SKBI. We're working with the business school. We'd love to do work a lot more uh, because we believe, again, that you know, investing at the right stage with, with, knowledge is, with, with centers of, of knowledge is very critical. So if we think over time of different levels of innovation and payments, different ways of thinking about consumers, someone like SMU would be a key partner for us to establish even more things going forward. So my request to you is keep an open mind, President, we'll come to you with more and more, uh, but hopefully so that it's a win-win for both of us. Uh, and hopefully we can get Anne here more often uh, to come and preside over, over some of these. So I won't hold you much longer. Um, I, I think I'm going to, uh, before we move to the report findings, I would love to invite on stage our special guest, uh, Mr. Edward Robinson, who's the Assistant Managing Director of Econo Economic Policy for MAS, who would probably enhance what I've said in a much better and eloqu eloquent fashion, but more importantly, give you a sense on how the regulator thinks about this, how important it is, and why this is a piece of the puzzle that they try and manage as they think about Singapore going forward. Thank you very much. Vindy, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming on stage our guest of honor for today, Mr. Edward Robinson, Assistant Managing Director, Economic <coughs> Policy of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Um, Professor De Meyer, President of SMU, uh, Vicky Vindra, President MasterCard Worldwide for Asia Pacific Middle East and Africa. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and I'm delighted to be here today to, uh, to witness the launch of the Singapore Index of Inflation Expectations, joint initiated by SKBI uh, and uh, MasterCard Worldwide. 
since its establishment in 2008, SKBI has been actively pursuing research topics in financial economics and econometrics relevant to Singapore and the region. The Institute's four major centres have already delivered notable research pieces uh, in the short span of time since its establishment. I'll just uh, mention two. This includes the early warning that uh, system for asset bubbles uh, and the Singapore Government Corporate uh, Governance Index, which was developed in collaboration with the Singapore Institute of Directors. SKBI's efforts to share and transfer research know-how through its organized conferences and seminars are also commendable. They help to create collaborative opportunities among and between academia, industry, and students. The ongoing partnership between Mastercard and SKBI that we see today is an excellent example of one such industry academia tie-up, and I'm pleased that this collaboration very quickly and early has resulted in the launch today of the survey uh, that we will witness today. Mastercard certainly has vast expertise in surveying consumer intentions and behaviour, which I can imagine will be very critical to this project. At a broader level, the MES is very keen on, on efforts to promote financial and economic research in Singapore. And, and let me take you to quickly three reasons why we see this as so. First, given the rapidly changing global economic and financial landscape, the timely dissemination and analysis of relevant information is essential for market participants and policymakers to make well-informed, efficient decisions. Second, the tectonic eastward shift of the world's center of economic gravity necessitates thought leadership on trends that are specific to the region. And third, by promoting more proactive knowledge discovery and fostering better informed decision making, a vibrant financial and economic research ecosystem can in itself become a source of comparative advantage for Singapore as an international financial center. Now SKBI has collaborated with MasterCard to introduce an inflation expectations survey of the general public, the first of its kind in Singapore. Let me say a few words of how I see the role of expectations in macroeconomics. As many of you will know, one of the truly revolutionary developments in macroeconomic analysis has been the recognition that expectations are central to the behavior of agents. Keynes, for example, argued that weak or dampened animal spirits could be behind an underemployment equilibrium. Since investment spending decisions rest on, and in his words, the extreme precariousness of the basic knowledge on which our estimates of prospective yield have come have to be made. Since Keynes' time, expectations have been integrated into the structure of many contemporary macroeconomic models to formalize assumptions. Uh, for, to formalize assumptions. Let me focus on examples in the modeling of inflation expectations. You will remember that an early application was the relationship between inflation expectations and interest rates uh, pointed out by Irving Fisher. The Fisher effect arises when nominal interest rates increases one to one with expectation with expected inflation. The, Do the Nobel laureates Friedman and Edmund Phelps were the first to suggest that inflation could provide a stimulus to output and, in, and employment via the so-called Phillips curve relation, but only to the extent that they were they are unexpected. This powerful insight in macroeconomics formed the basis of the expectation of mental Phillips curve something very central to central bankers, and the idea that inflation expectations are crucial determinants of observed inflation and thus have a critical bearing on the central bank's ability to obtain uh, stability. It is now widely accepted that with well-incurred inflation expectations, price shocks do not have lasting effects, and central banks may find that they have less need to induce large swings in economic output in order to control inflation, thereby achieving a better growth inflation trade-off. Indeed, over the last few decades, Singapore's actual price changes have shown very little persistence to shock, something that I think would be also verified by this new index over time. How expectations are formed also matters a good deal. 
economic models that assume fully rational expectations, as you know, place an even greater emphasis on the credibility of the central bank. If agents believe that the central bank is committed to ensuring price stability, then changing inflation expectations can be achieved at relatively low sacrifice out, uh, ratio. In models with adaptive expectations, the past behavior of inflation also matters. So that incorporating both rational and adaptive expectations consistently into a model ensures that the central bank's credibility and historical track record complement one another. But this sort of principle and concept is something that's very important to our work in the MEA as we combine both adaptive and, 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 and uh, forward-looking expectations. Measures of inflation expectations are now a central feature of many state-of-art new Keynesian DSCG models, for example, uh, that incorporate also nominal rigidities. At MES, macro models have played an integral role in economic analysis and policy formulation since 1990, when our first comprehensive macro model, the SING mod, was developed. Today, we use a suite of models, all of which explicitly include the role of expectation. For instance, our current flagship model, the monetary model of Singapore MMS, the key mechanism through which inflation expectations affect inflation is through individual wage setting relations based on, on what I previously referred to as the expectation of method flip skirt. Wage code is affected by a weighted average of rational forward looking agents and adaptive or backward looking uh, agents forming uh, inflation expectations. Our new model which we introduced to our micro uh, economic review last year, the satellite model of Singapore or SMS, has a forward looking new Keynesian Phillips curve. Principally derived from micro foundations in which inflation is a function of past and future expected inflation as well as the output gap as, as, uh, as is common to such formulations. The equation we think embodies the key ideas of the macro synthesis, the modern macro synthesis, in stark contrast to standard price markup models, which, by the way, are much easier to estimate and tend to be a lot more well behaved in, 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 in general equivalent settings. But we need, the idea here is to get realistically calibrated models to help MES better formulate monetary policy responses and importantly gauge. There is their transmission effects to the economy. Over the past few years in Singapore, there have been a growing number of surveys that attempt to gather information on economic agents' expectations and behavior. Apart from surveys of business expectations in manufacturing and services sector carried out by the EDB and the Department of Statistics, there are others such as manpower surveys that capture the important employers' hiring intentions. These surveys have helped to piece together a more complete picture of economic activity on the ground and are followed closely by markets, analysts, and certainly policymakers and central bankers. Besides allowing surveys users to develop a more informed judgment of the state of the economy, survey results are also useful as leading indicators of future economic activity. However, these surveys have tended to be largely activity-based. Thus, SKBI and MasterCard's new survey is a natural and, well, uh, and a welcome initiative. Such a gauge of the public's inflation expectations will complement the information in existing surveys that tend to target the analysts of the professional community, most notably the MA survey of professional forecasters. But measurement itself is only the first step toward understanding inflation expectations. And a deep understanding of it requires a further in investigation of the behavioral models in which expectations are embedded. With recent advances in the field of behavioral economics, for example, it is hoped that we will be able to develop deeper insights into how expectations are formed and how they actually influence um, aggregate economic outcomes. For example, since analysts and broader public face differential cost functions, uh, differential cost of acquiring and processing information, the results from the survey can provide a rich source of data to test 
uh, the hypothesis of rationality in different groups forming kitchen expectations in Singapore. To sum up, let me say that there's been a step up in research on economics and financial issues done in Singapore over the past few years, and that has been very much welcomed uh, within the policymaking circle. This is increasingly important in a broader sense as we position ourselves as a key international financial center. It is heartening to, to the MES to see SKBI's latest collaboration with MasterCard worldwide in such an important measure for Singapore. With this, let me congratulate SKBI and MasterCard Worldwide on the launch of the Education Index today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. Our next speaker this morning is Dr. Yua Hedrick Wong. And Dr. Yua is Global Economic Advisor for MasterCard Worldwide. Prior to this role, he was Economic Advisor to MasterCard in Asia Pacific, a position he held since 2001. As Economic Advisor, he chairs a MasterCard Knowledge Panel <coughs> of Leading Economists, Policy Analysts, academics and business strategists for regular exchange and knowledge sharing. Dr. Yua will now present on debt and inflation dynamics in the global economy and the challenges for Asian populations. Thank you very much, and good morning, and welcome, <coughs> everyone. Um, one of the prominent features uh, in the global economy since the 2008 global crisis is the massive amount of government debt has been accumulating and is continuing to today. And that in turn has an instant impact across the entire global economy in the form of uh, its impact on uh, interest rate, uh, impact on uh, exchange rate movement, for instance, uh, and of course, uh, respect, with respect to, to sovereign risk uh, and other relevant issues. But one of which really is how it has, I think, affected uh, the uh, movement of inflation. Uh, not so much in the developed markets where the debt's been accumulating, but especially in emerging markets and in Asia in particular. I think that's really an issue that we have to, to, to focus on uh, uh, going forward. Uh, the, the situation is far from over. Uh, in fact, uh, 2012, we can uh, say Happy New Year to everyone uh, just now, <laughs> to President Vicky and so on. And uh, I think Happy New Year for sure. I wish that that's what, what we're going to get, but I can promise you we're going to get a very interesting year as well. Uh, so let me begin with some uh, history with respect to government debt and how it can be resolved. Uh, the best way to, to, to resolve high government debt uh, situation is to really to grow out of it. This is really a look at the United States uh, starting from 1929 uh, all the way uh, to 2008, uh, uh, to 2009. And three curves are presented. Uh, the red one is the government debt to GDP ratio, which you've seen and has been quoted all the time by the media. The, uh, sorry, the, 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 the blue one is government debt to GDP ratio. The red one, however, is less often quoted, but I think is far more important, is uh, government debt to tax revenue ratio. Uh, it gives you a completely different face on how bad the situation is with respect to a, a country uh, for government debt. And then the, the green line is really the household debt uh, to average annual disposable income ratio. Now, the, the key here is that if you look at the sharp uh, spike uh, around uh, 1945 and, uh, with respect to government debt, uh, and that is because of the end of the Second World War and, and the United States actually has been producing, supplying, and fighting, you know, global war. Uh, and uh, as you know, Roosevelt said, well, the U.S. performed as the, the arsenal for democracy. So a huge amount of government debt has been accumulated. So it's roughly about uh, the, looking at the left side a scale with respect to the blue uh, curve. It's about 100, close to 130 percent of GDP. But if you were to look at the government. Uh, the, the debt to government tax uh, uh, ratios, which is the right side, uh, 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 right hand side scale, uh, is you're talking about close to about 600 percent. So it's a massive amount of debt being accumulated. But also, you can see that in the decade following, it's been resolved because of high economic growth. And even though we're looking at both left and right scales, the, the important thing is the slope. The, the, the slope is a lot steeper with respect to the red curve, and that is growth is high enough to actually allow government to continue to collect more and more revenues to bring down its debt. 
Uh, that's me the key. Now, but uh, also it shows uh, uh, different sets of, of lessons learned for today. Well, think about what happened at the end of the Second World, uh, World War in the United States. Within six months, from 10 million people armed, so a huge amount in terms of payroll, paying 10 million people in the armed forces fighting the war. Uh, in six months, at the end of the war, it was down to 500,000. There's a ration system introduced through the course of the war, so there's huge pent up demand. And households with savings, uh, so there's a lot of potential demand out there. Meantime, the production capacity, because the war effort has been massively increased, so the supply side has been strongly boosted. Uh, and, and as business convert from war production to production for civilian purposes and so on, this is a huge supply side pipeline being developed to basically provide whatever American households wanted. But that's another side to it as well as the, that's the, the positive uh, demographics. And all the GIs going home after the war, what do they do? Well, they make babies. So there's a huge ramp up in household formation, therefore the demand for new homes and all the appliances and so on. That's really what drove very high pace of economic growth um, at that time to allow uh, arguably one of the historically unprecedented government debt level to be brought down very quickly. I'm saying all this because I want to emphasize the point that every single one of those conditions I mentioned for bringing down the debt very quickly is absent today in the developed markets. So we have a big, big challenge ahead. And let me illustrate this with what I call the adverse debt dynamics. And this is Italy. If you look at, again, the same kind of setup as the previous chart, the blue curve, government debt to GDP ratio is essentially unchanged. And so all the way back to E2000. And so why the recent panic about Italy? It's very peculiar. It's not because in the last few years, the Italian government suddenly became irresponsible. He was irresponsible for a long, long time. <laughs> uh, and the only difference is that it's a red curve. You can see that it's spiking. It's going up. And then the market started to notice growth is not high enough for the Italian government to blame down its debt. Period. It's as simple as that. So it's that adverse debt dynamics is panicking the market. And very similar situation, it's Greeks you can see much more sharp uh, uptick okay, of the red curve versus the blue. Okay, again, this is the kind of adverse debt dynamics that is making the situation uh, far worse going forward. Except Spain, I won't go into it, the UK, uh, and so on. So, uh, uh, so my, my point here is that you know, with austerities and so on in the Eurozone, uh, we are not going to get out of the debt uh, 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 situation for a long, long time to come. Uh, so the only solution today, uh, whatever the scenario may come about in the Eurozone, uh, is for the government to take on a lot more debt. That is a given. Uh, how much? Well, uh, the, on the right-hand side, the chart shows you the estimate by the end of last year, what the world GDP is roughly $70 trillion. And among the OECD countries, uh, most of the OECD countries are piling up debt at a very fast pace today. For 2012, uh, it's likely to be another $10.5 trillion. This is roughly 15%, one five uh, of the world GDP will be required in terms of government borrowing uh, to sustain the current situation. It may be more, depending on some specifics. So that's going to be a lot more debt incurred uh, going forward. Um, and that's going to affect, as I mentioned at the beginning, the global conditions in terms of interest rate, in terms of uh, exchange rate movement, in terms of capital flow. Uh, that is where emerging markets are being uh, 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 impacted. Uh, this is look at changes in foreign reserves, contrasting between the first half of the year from all January to August last year to September and November. A sudden change in the global condition, you can see the massive difference in inflow and outflow, uh, 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 and then in turn, uh, uh, changing the, the balance of foreign reserves in uh, China, India, Indonesia, and so on. And that's how the, the entire region is affected. And then with respect to uh, capital flow, uh, foreign holding of local currency, this is important, local currency denominated bonds, again, you can see that from August to November, the period where there's a, 
a heightened risk aversion uh, in the global market. This is how much is the decline that we saw in Indonesia and Thailand. In the case of Indonesia, this is almost half, a reduction by half of foreign holding of local currency denominated bonds. And of course, Asia continues to have very high exposure uh, to Europe. That's what the right hand side of the chart is about. And this is looking at the European Bank's share of trade finance for Asia, for emerging Asia. That's about 40%. Uh, it's not insignificant. So anything that may happen with the, uh, the, the, the banking uh, sector in, in Europe will have instantaneously uh, uh, its corresponding impact on how trade finance is being conducted uh, in Asia. So the risk is there and it's real. Um, foreign direct investment is a lot more stable. So that can be an anchor uh, for many of the key emerging markets in Asia. But unfortunately, that applies to very few of the emerging markets. You can see here, China is the one that, if you look at, this is the, the chart showing uh, the FDI flow from 2009, 2010, and estimated a free quarter in 2011. is a continuous uptick in spite of the unfolding of the global crisis. But the same cannot be said for many other markets. So said, even that one anchor would have limited utility for uh, maintaining uh, regional stability going forward in Asia. So the point is, is that we're going to see 2012 continuous flip-flop between uh, risk appetite and risk aversion, and every time that, that happens, global capital flow will be affected. Uh, and this is looking at uh, Asian currencies against the US dollar percentage change between the first and the second uh, half of last year. You can see, again, uh, the very much uh, uh, volatility that I've been describing. China is an exception because it's still very tightly managed, whereas when there is currency convertibility, the, the, the change in, in, in the capital flow in the global market would manifest itself instantaneously in this kind of currency volatility. So very quickly now, just to look at, you know, from January 2006 to October 2011, the kind of uh, uh, consumer price movement and how it's correlated with quantitative easing and the flip-flop between uh, risk aversion and risk appetite and so on. And uh, this is North, uh, North Asia, China, uh, Taiwan, Korea, and Hong Kong. And the uh, decline and the rise, you can see the decline is really the process leading to the, uh, the, the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, but they started to pick up again very quickly in this aftermath relating to quantitative easing in the developed markets and a similar picture for uh, Southeast Asia. And the one country that's completely out of control is Vietnam. Um, I won't digress too much, but uh, uh, Vietnam does not really have a, from my, my personal view, uh, a functional uh, a central bank. So the monetary policy uh, management is very, very poor. I think we should second Mr. Robinson there to uh, get things straightened out as quickly as possible. Um, and this is uh, looking at India, Malaysia, and Singapore now. Uh, the, the, the actual magnitude is different, but the, the, the shape is, is the same. Uh, so for Singapore, uh, inflation ex expectation, I mean, a, a more precise rule of in inflation expectation is critical, simply because it's a small open economy. With this kind of global uh, uh, volatility, there's no escaping the fact that uh, every time when there's a flip-flop uh, between risk aversions and, and risk appetite, uh, when there's a, a quantitative easing versus a, 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 a reduction in, in credit creation, uh, Singapore's only affected. But it's only when inflation expectation is embedded in the domestic economy that you would have a real issue uh, with respect to uh, monetary policy uh, making. So uh, I think that the, 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 the Singapore Inflation Expectation Index has been launched today uh, will be very, very useful uh, to allow uh, a, a monetary policy making and management in Singapore to achieve a much higher level of specificity and, and, and precision uh, that would provide longer term uh, price stability as well as, as Vicky mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Vicky, by the way, there was a very sharp observation in spite of the fact that you know, uh, Manu may not pass you for economic 101, uh, but it's really the balance between price stability and growth. 
that, that's the balance. And getting inflation expectation right is very crucial as a variable. Now, I think I've got three minutes left. So what I'd like to do is to mention one more thing. Uh, vigilance against inflation is crucial in today's global environment. And sadly, uh, inflation can be very seductive for public policy making. Let me give you one parable to illustrate this point. Uh, uh, a British couple decided to take a holiday on a beautiful island in the South Pacific. Natives very friendly, they spent a whole year living happily on this resort paradise. And every time when they try to pay, the host runs the resort, say, no, 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 you pay when you leave. So when they finish the year's holiday, they said, well, how much I owe you? They mentioned a the number, they, so this British couple wrote a check and gave it to the owner of the resort. And they went home. Five years later, they realized the check has never been cashed. It turns out the local liked this couple so much, they, they believe they're really honorable people. They started using the check locally as part of the currency. The resort owner started using the check to pay somebody else and, and so on and so forth. So the paradox is for me to pose the question to all of you is that, well, who paid for that holiday? Thank you very much. Gosh will take us through the findings from the report.